and let's get started. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we have a great webinar for you. Um, just a quick reminder before we get started, if you are not part of the Startup CPG Slack, please join the Slack. Um, we have about 15,000 people. It's a great community. Um, and one of the benefits of being part of the Startup CPG community is access to Nielsen. We have a partnership with Nielsen and they allow us three free reports. Um, and we also have, you know, webinars here and then um, like today. And so today we are with Patrick and he's going to teach us a lot about um, data and um, how you can use it for your investor decks. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it's great to, to meet everybody. If, if you haven't, uh, if I haven't talked to you before, join one of the previous webinars that we've done. I've done with uh, startup CPG it's great to meet you. Um, I'll be going over uh, a little bit about how to communicate with investors today, but to give uh, myself a brief introduction here first, I've been with Nielsen for about 10 years and I lead our uh, small medium business segment, specifically focused on grocery or center stores, kind of my specialty, but we can have a deep expertise in retail scan data, point of sale data, panel data, a wide variety of information. So if you have any questions either during the webinar or, or afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to help or put you in touch with the person who can if I can't. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started here if, if that's okay with everyone. And are you able to see my screen okay? Yep, it's loading right now. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to echo if we want to make this as interactive as possible. So drop any questions into the chat or Q&A, and I'll try to moderate as best I can. Great. So today I'm, I'm, I'm going to dive into how, you know, I guess some best practices that we've seen from a lot of our clients in terms of how they're communicating with investors. I think there's a, there's a lot of big general use cases that a lot of brands have with our data. I think the primary thing that most clients, especially in that emerging brand space, are looking to use data for is to communicate their performance to retailers, to help gain more distribution, to kind of tell their story uh, for that, you know, help them grow directly from that. Uh, one of the other reasons that I think is underutilized is using the data to communicate investor with investors, and this is especially important for those emerging brands that are in that re those really early stages, being able to dive into the data, tell your story, um, and and kind of lay out the groundwork of what an investor is looking for, and how to start to craft some of that data that you can get your hands on to effectively communicate and create that partnership with your investing team and prospective investors as well. And there's there's six, you know, we're, we're kind of taking this topic and simplifying it down to six basic pieces that we really need to start to get a really good grasp on to start having successful conversations with, exist, with investors. The first, <clears throat> which is the most important, especially if you're in those startup funding rounds, we're trying to, you know, get that, the, big capital investments, especially in the early stages, is it still all about what are you solving for? What is your story? What is your mission? Everything has to go through that lens. Story sells. It's it's what makes your business compelling. It's what makes your company compelling. All these other pieces are little puzzle pieces to help build around that. But if we take into account as we kind of go through all these different areas, Everything has to be through that lens of what is your story, what is your mission, and how does your strategy fit into this. The data that we're crafting here is not meant to be necessarily the focal point, but more the support pieces for that to help guide you through that strategy, help you create those benchmarks, help you make the right moves, and be strategic in how you're approaching the marketplace and in approaching investors. The next piece is starting to understand who is that target consumer and being very focused on that. And we'll dive into you know, how we can do that with data a little bit and some of the strategies to use, but also you know, what, what are we seeing in the data in terms of what people we recommend for uh, emerging brands and how they focus on, on that consumer. Are we just get it, taking distribution where we can get it? Are we really zooming in on a specific demographic? Or are we just shotgunning our, our, our brand out there and seeing who picks it up? Uh, we'll cover that a little bit as well understanding the size of the market and where that opportunity lies in terms of that total addressable market and what we can actually go out and get, how we can start to measure up against that, 
how we start to tell a story of how we're different, how your brand or your company is different and how that fits within that mission and that story and how that also attaches to that target consumer really being able to dive in and get that proof of traction that investors are looking for, which is a huge one when we're communicating with investors. We have to show it that momentum is there, um, that th this idea, that this product, this company has legs and that we're building momentum in the marketplace. And then we kind of get into the nitty gritty and, and into the data a little bit more for the forecast and benchmarks through that ROI lens. How do we start to communicate you know, this is a, that your company is a company worth investing in. Um, and, and we'll kind of dive into some of that uh, as we go through it as well. So the first piece is kind of like I mentioned, the really important piece and the thing that we have to take through, you know, everything else that we're going through, through this lens of what is your story? What is your company's mission? And being able to communicate that very effectively. You know, what is the problem that you're out there solving in the marketplace? And is that problem worth solving? So especially if when putting together pitch decks, when you're going to talk to investors or even just creating, you know, the packaging for your product, creating everything that's involved, all the different claims and certifications you might want to take a look at. Having a real fundamental idea of what is that problem and is it a problem that we can make money solving um, and that's worthy of investment. It's a really big piece telling that story selling yourself, that's what investors are looking to, you know, get them excited, establish that emotional connection with consumers and being able to use the data to help tell that story can be very important. I've attached a slide here that kind of does some, you know, from a deck that uh, others have used where we can start to identify, you know, if you have a brand that you're looking to say, hey, Americans aren't healthy, there's a lot of you know, struggles going out there with American health and how do we start to turn that around? There's a lot of different data sources that we can use to help identify what that problem is and show the scale of it. Um, that it's a big problem that it's worth solving. This is one example. We do have a bunch of different capabilities that allow us to dive deep into what different ailments people have or what, you know, where consumers are ranking certain priorities in terms of sustainability or in terms of social issues or whatever it may be, there's a lot of different use cases that we have to help quantify the issue that you're out there trying to solve. So again, we're starting to build the framework for how do we identify that this is a, a problem that we're solving, that this is a mission that's worth us taking on and putting numbers to it, putting a trend to it to help that buyer really visualize that this is a substantial issue that we're focusing on, or it doesn't have to be as, you know, in depth as, you know, America's obese, it could be something much lighter, a lighter topic than that. But it's an example of how we can start to quantify what is out there in the market, what are, is our mission, how are we starting to approach it, and why it's important and why it's relevant. So that's, that's a really big initial piece that, you know, I, I think most companies do have that sense, you know, and a lot of the, the entrepreneurs that we work with that are heading up these companies have that strong sense of purpose, that strong sense of mission, communicating it, getting the data to to quantify that is, is definitely very important. But as we dive into that, everything is gonna to start to pull into that specific framework of tying everything back into that mission. So where we just saw, you know, Americans have these issues, if this is an area that we wanna dive into, we have to start to deconstruct that into the different areas in terms of how we tell the story of why our product or why our company is helping address it. Targeting our consumer is, is a big one that I think a lot of companies struggle with initially. And an example that we like to, or I like to bring up that's not in the CPG space, but it's an example is we have a lot of clients out there that take really more of that shotgun approach where it's, I just want to get my product out there. It tastes great. Everyone is, is, you know, they try to be too much to too many people. Where if you take a company like a Lululemon, for example, that was really focused on a very specific target market, especially when they're starting, when they're in that emerging phase, being able to identify, hey, I'm going after women who love yoga and they are dedicated to yoga. I'm going to dive in, you know, start to, to focus specifically on that very hyper specific group. And then as we scale and as we grow, we can branch off into a men's line or into a kid's line or you know, whatever the other areas are that it, it becomes, once it becomes, it gains that traction and, and has that appeal, it can start to branch our product lines out. But at the start, having that very focused 
um, target market can be very important. And we have a lot of different areas that can help you identify specifically who is the current shopper of this specific category that we're looking in and be able to also identify that across the, some of the different brands that are in that competitive space along with you. So a good first step is to be able to say, who is the current shopper of this category? Who is the current shop? How does that differ from who the current shopper is of some of these key competitors? And how does my target niche or whether it be a niche or be a little bit more broader, how does that fit in within this consumer group? You know, what percentage of, of you know, again, trying to si size the market a little bit, what percentage of, of customers are in this specific space that I'm looking for? If we're selling something that's gluten-free, what does that gluten-free consumer look like? And what brands are they currently buying? What options do they currently have? And are they staying away from a certain category? Am I trying to bring consumers in that aren't currently shopping in certain categories because options don't exist? There's a lot of different ways that we can start to dive in and I analyze who is that current shopper and how do we start to put that story together of who my, my shopper, the one that I'm going to target after, is and especially how again how does that fit back into that mission into that story that we're trying to tell the other piece is and how do we start to reach that audience um so if we've identified here's the shopper i want to go after it's differentiated from the category as a whole because of xyz it's differing from my competitive set a little bit but how do we start to reach that target audience um how do we get in front of them what other products are they buying what other you know even what publications are they reading or what TV shows are they watching? What types of cars do they drive? Understanding deeply that, that target market, not only from your marketing plans and things like that, but really understanding who that market is, what that potential looks like. And is that a target market that can accommodate the growth that you're looking for? There's a lot of different areas to help analyze, but when you're presenting this information to an investor and they're looking to see, you know, is this is the addressable market out there big enough to support, you know, what your growth plans are having that in your back pocket, having that as a, a presentation to show, you know, we saw 35% of Americans are obese. That's how many millions of Americans. And if we can just get X number of, you know, percentage of penetration, we're starting to create some of those targets without even trying too hard because we can have that data, that solid foundation to build some of these projections off of. Hey, Patrick. Yeah. yeah, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so identifying your target consumer is so, so important, as everyone who's making a brand knows. A lot of times in investor decks, people will say like, oh, my target consumer is like a millennial or Gen Z. Patrick, do you feel like that's enough? Or do you feel like, you know, investors are going to want different information about your target consumer? I think they're going to typically want a little bit more. Um, only because it's, it's a very, there, there's one thing about saying, Hey, my target market is X, Y, Z, but how, like having the actual understanding of how you capture that market is another piece and understanding the size and how that is, is warranted. So if I have a brand out there and I'm trying to reach Gen Z, for example, is there a specific segmentation of Gen Z? Are we just diving in and, and you know, shotgunning the whole generation somehow, and how are we reaching that? How are we attaining that? It can be much more palpable if we have a much more specific target that we really can zoom in on and start to attract um, that allows us to get much more specific and much more accurate in terms of how we can start to quantify what that opportunity looks like and what type of uh, traction that we can start to build with it. So I would recommend definitely going deeper. And if you make, you know, if you're making pickled eggs, for example, and you want to market that to Gen Z, you know, what what is their propensity to purchase of something like that? You know, having some insi insight into, you know, how rough of a transition is it to get to steal shoppers over from other categories or bring them into new categories or steal from my, my competitors, whatever it may be being able to understand what that penetration looks like amongst those competitive sets and amongst the different categories can be important too, especially when you're communicating a strategy and trying to prove that this idea that this company um, has legs. That's super helpful. Yeah, and I can see all the different segmentation on your slide here. There's mm -hmm. income level, there's children, there's, you know, and then they have like different types of couples and households, super interesting.
Yeah. And we can get much more in depth than even just the segmentations that are on the screen. There's a, there's a lot of different ways that we can segment pieces. If you make if you have a pet brand, you know, am I going after, you know, you know, uh, families of fives with a cat and a dog, or do I want to take a look at those families that have six cats and four dogs? And there's a lot of depth and granularity that we can ultimately get to, if you need to. Um, but there's lots of different ways that we can slice and dice the data to get you the insights that you're looking at to really help you hone in on that competitive set. And I think this all, again, kind of speaks to ensuring that that strategy aligns and that you kind of have, have these different pieces put together, that you are creating certain KPIs, that you're monitoring the shifts as time goes on. You know, make sure that you're uncovering the trends that are taking place within these demographic uh, structures that are out there you know, and, and try to get ahead of them, either be on trend, be ahead of the trend, or, you know, anticipate that you're going to be a brand that changes that trend. Um, but having something to measure yourself, measure your progress against, especially when it, as it pertains to competitive sets can be important. This especially becomes true as you continue to grow and you get new distribution and perhaps markets that aren't as super much of a fit. You know, if you're just in the Northeast and trying to expand to a different part of the country, Demographics can change in terms of how products will, or people will, and consumers will engage with your product. So there's a lot of, of cool information that we can get into helping you identify that target, helping you to quantify the size of that target, helping you strategize against that target in terms of how we start to do that marketing outreach and where we plan that expansion. Um, that can be very important as well. Making sure that you identify which you know, retailers are best uh, best fit, give you the best opportunity to hit that that target audience. And you're not just taking distribution wherever, getting distribution, but then, you know, perhaps the product not doing as well on, on shelf because it's not resonating as clearly. I think another big one too, is to ensure that, that you know, that your product is effectively able to communicate with the target audience that you're looking for. Do you have the right certifications? Do you have the right uh, attributes called out on pack is your pack type uh, or all the, the the package art you know is it educating the client or the, your your consumer enough in terms of what they're actually looking for what you're trying to communicate to the consumer who picks up your product the next piece so once we kind of have that target consumer uh in our heads, we, we've been able to communicate who that target consumer is and make educated uh, decisions on who we should be going after and how we start to strategize against going after that, that consumer. Another big piece is starting to really understand the market that we're looking to get into and, and not going you know, too far too fast in some cases. So we wanna look at channel importance, You know what channels are driving growth, understand the lay of the land, understand the dynamics that are taking place within the category. Um, you know, do I start to sell primarily online or now, oh, QVC is hitting me up and we want to do a QVC run. Is that something that's, you know, aligned with our brand strategy? Starting to understand where the volume is moving in these categories, understanding where that, that what the size of the prize is in each of these channels and what's really driving the different trend changes within those channels can be very important. The same goes for retailer fit. You know, what retailers, if if you have a dream of, hey, I want to be in Whole Foods one day, but, you know, what? how much volume does that actually mean if I were to get 1% market share in Whole Foods or if I get 1% market share in Target or 1% market share in Publix? Having a good understanding of what retailers, A, fit my demographics that I'm going after well and are able to, you know, have the volume, have, are, are strategically place to, to perform well with my, you know, whatever makes my product unique, so on and so forth. There's a lot there from a retailer fit that we also want to take a look at, how many new brands are coming in uh, to that specific retailer or to that specific market, but also even looking at regional strategy. We run into a lot of brands that are really focused on going big, fast. They just want to get out there. They want to go national everywhere right away. And sometimes their manufacturing capacity just can't keep up with that or they spread themselves too thin. And it can sometimes work better if we stick to a specific, um, you know, if we, if we start in a certain area, let's really dominate that area first. And before we start to dive out more into other, you know, ge geographies, other states, other markets, 
having that feel for what these different areas and what these different geographies and how they're engaging with, you know, how your product, how your category performs in those different markets can be very crucial to making educated decisions on how you want to, you know, release that expansion. The other piece is really understanding the competitive set, knowing the landscape of the brands that you're competing against, knowing where they're located, how much volume they're doing, and being able to use them as almost a proxy to help you set some of those benchmarks and some of those growth targets that you might have. We have a lot of clients that will go and they'll take a look at, you know, if they're modeling themselves after a, a, a couple of their, their competitors in the marketplace, being able to see what type of growth were they able to achieve and what mistakes that they make that I can learn from by looking at their performance over time. There's a lot there from understanding what that market is, what that total addressable market is, and how much of that can I take or can I start to, to gain traction with over the time that you're with in that investing period. Understanding that size of the market and being able to <clears throat> basically highlight that strategy is, is very important. Understanding that velocity growth, understanding the distribution growth that it takes to get to certain areas. If you have certain revenue targets that you're trying to hit over a certain amount of time, being able to go you know, and, and lay out a detailed plan in terms of what retailers should I be targeting this year versus next year. There's a lot of different pieces there to that puzzle that you can start to, to dive into the data. Helps make that process a lot easier it helps to communicate that growth trajectory to investors much, much easier. It also helps you start to identify where those areas of opportunity are and where those retailers are that have great fit with your, your target audience, with your target, uh, with your mission. Um, there's a lot of different areas that you can start to dive into to, to make sure that you're not flying blind and just taking distribution wherever you can get it. Make sure that those different targets are really aligned with what that mission, with what that story is. With that said, we, we can start to dive a little bit into, you know, we've we've identified who that what your mission is, what your, that story is, what the problem you're solving and it's worth solving, who that target audience is, and making sure that it's aligned with with that mission and that with that story and that there's that size there that that you can go after identifying where those pockets of growth and opportunity are. The next piece is really starting to highlight why your product is, is different and what makes you guys unique and that you're on trend with that pro with that process. We, one of the things that makes Nielsen IQ very unique is we have a lot of ways to really dive deep into the, into the coding of our products to create insights on many of those different certifications that are very important or some of those different um, claims that you could be making on PAC. You know, if, if I'm saying that I have a product that is solving for X, is that a problem that, you know, how is that, that other products that have a similar claim performing out there? Am I on trend? Is this something that's gaining traction out there in the market? And being able to communicate how, you know, what your story is through the framework of what trends are currently taking place or what trends you think are about to come about can be very important. This on, on the slide here is just an example of some of the different types of Pieces where you can start to say, hey, products that are zero waste are up 34% or products that are organic are outperforming, they're up 27%, whatever it may be. There's lots of different claims that make what your product is unique, that tie back into that, that, that uh, target consumer, that tie back into that mission, starting to quantify what the size of that looks like and showing that outperformance that you're on trend or you're ahead of trend can be very important to showing you know, some of that traction that we'll be talking about in a little bit here. But because we have that in-depth ability to really dive into the data and, and get, you know, segments by a lot of these different health and wellness claims or sustainability claims or socially responsible claims, um, there's a lot of, of meat there that we can start to really tell a compelling story about why this product will work. Even if it's a new product that's, that's very innovative, there's not anything like it, it's still addressing different concerns that your product is also addressing that we can start to put numbers to and highlight either just how unique your product is or start to identify, you know, there's other products in other categories, but this one's specifically unique, but it's addressing a problem that a lot of people are focusing on right now or that's going to be coming up and we're ahead of trend and this is going to start becoming a bigger deal and starting to address that total size of what's out there. So highlighting that what makes your product unique works is, is very important and just showing how unique you are. You know, if you, if you are one of those brands that's very specialized in a certain area, you're like, I'm the only, 
you know, one in this category that can, that is, you know, X, Y, Z highlighting that, you know, we're the only ones in the category that can do X, Y, Z, but here's the total problem in the marketplace. This is why this fits this need really well. There's a lot of different pieces here that we can start to really tell a compelling story. And it also starts to help us identify, you know, where some of those gaps might be from an education perspective with our consumers and how are we ensuring that when our product is out there on the shelf and a consumer walks by it, do they truly understand what this is solving for? Um, especially if there's not any many other products out there with that type of claim, being able to identify, you know, does my package effectively communicate what I'm looking for it to do? And having that reassurance that, you know, a certain trend is is really performing well and that it's 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 growing quite rapidly, having to investor that look, you know, this organic seal is performing really well. This is why it's important that we have this organic seal. There may be can be very impactful as well and, and give that reassurance, take some of that risk, uh the perception of risk away from an investor. So this, you know, after kind of going down this road and we we've talked about that mission, we talked about the target consumer, we talked about identifying that marketplace and what makes you unique and showing that you're on trend with, with a lot of those claims that you're making, showing that proof that you're gaining momentum is, is very, very important. And you kind of take that momentum wherever you can find it. So there's a lot of different ways that we can start to show that momentum in the marketplace, whether it be through your revenue or unit growth, your distribution growth with new retail partners, or, you know, even more SKUs, you're getting more SKUs out in the marketplace, your total uh, distribution points or TDP is increasing. Velocity growth is my same store sales growth improving year over year. Is my penetration growing? Is my social media following getting bigger if we don't have, uh, if you don't have the data to show it or your, or your number of POs or shipments increasing? Being able to show that you're building on something and gaining that momentum really quickly is important. We have some really cool tools to help do that. In, in this uh, slide here, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, it's taking a look at all these different retailers that a, a brand is in and showing that distribution change, showing different hurdle rates for velocity, and being able to say, you know, my product is bringing an X number of dollars per store compared to my products that are competitor products, or, you know, I'm outperforming other products that are considered brand new or products that are at risk, average products. There's a lot of ways to start to tell your story a little bit, and we'll dive into that in a little bit more in more detail to show you specifically how to do that. But there's a lot of different ways to really start to show that you have the momentum in the marketplace and you're taking advantage of it. And, and then you have plans to keep that momentum going uh, and growing. Another way outside of just looking at, you know, your typical dollars and units is also taking a look at some of that shopper behavior. You know, how many new households am I entering in? What does my repeat purchase rate look like? What is my, is my loyalty improving? What is my dollars or units per household going up or down? There's lots of different angles that we can start to show that momentum, but the more that we can start to really highlight that, hey, we're building something, it's, it's catching fire, that's what's gonna get investors excited. We have a lot of different ways to do that. So if, you if you're if you struggling to find those areas of momentum, definitely give us a call and we can walk you through that a little bit. But there's lots of different areas that we can touch on to help build that story, showing that growth. Even if you might be down, uh, you know, from a dollar a unit growth perspective, you know, the whole market's down from unit perspective, basically right now, year over year. Unit volume has been a tough one uh, with the inflationary environment that we're in. But you know, finding those areas where that momentum is building and, and really highlighting those heavily is important. And it all becomes relevant to what the category is doing. So it's not just in a vacuum. Obviously, the more growth that we can see, the better, especially when talking to investors, but showing that sustainable growth and showing that it's outperforming a category, outperforming peers is always going to carry a lot of weight. Yeah, for sure. No, I I think that's a I think that's a great place. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but yeah, I'll be another person to say like, yeah, there's so many different ways to cut data. Um, I know it's easy to be like, oh, like dollars are down or units are down, but that's just you know kind of the environment, especially units being down that we live in right now. So, um, if you could cut data through you know loyalty or percent penetration. I think those are all great ways. So thanks for sharing, Patrick. Yeah. 
The next piece is a big one too. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit more into the data quite a bit um, because there's a lot of, you know, everything we've been talking about is, is through that lens of that mission, through that story. But then, so once we've effectively told that story well, and we're able to communicate to that buyer or to that, that investor, hey, look, you know, I, I'm a great entrepreneur. Or my business is growing really strong. I'm getting lots of traction. I have all this stuff figured out. But now it comes time to start to, how do we start to discuss what that growth trajectory looks like, what that investor can expect from a KPI perspective, uh, what they can expect from an, in terms of ongoing uh, monitoring of that business and, and how do we start to identify when we're successful or not? How do we put those growth stories together and, and, and start to build upon you know, the, the traction that we already have? This is where the data becomes especially important in terms of being able to communicate not only upfront about what that forecast looks like or what those benchmarks will look like going forward, but also start to communicate through time as, you know, as you're continuing to operate, you know, what, how things are going. Are you on pace? Are you off pace? And having these different benchmarks and, and forecasts together is, is critical in terms of making sure that you're able to stay in that constant communication and that you can hold yourself accountable to meeting the different growth goals that you set for yourself. There's a few different ways that we recommend doing this, but for the most part, you know, a lot of times we have brands that will come to us and they'll ask, you know, how do we, how do we start to, how do we start to put some of those pieces into play? Um, I don't know where to start from a, a, a you know, distribution level, like where should I, how much growth should I be experiencing year over year? How much distribution growth should I be getting? Is this good or is this bad? Whatever the case may be. One thing that we tend to recommend doing is taking a look at some of those peer brands that you see as, as being in that competitive set, maybe slightly newer, um, could not be though, but where we can take a look at a five-year stretch of time. If we go back a full five years, break it out every month, and we start to take a look at what was this brand's path to where they're at now. Um, what was their distribution, you know, percent ACV, which we'll get into a little bit in a second here, their percent TDP. Well, how many stores were they selling in in year one versus year two versus year three? What is their velocity looking like over time? What how much share of the category were they willing to build in these different markets over you know the, the period of time that we're looking at? How many SKUs did they start with in the market, and how many do they have now? And what was their path to to expanding some of that? There's a lot of different ways that we can help you get some of that visibility. One one of the big ways that I I really recommend, like I said, is if we take three or four of those competitive brands that you're looking at, and starting to break that down we can start to kind of take an average of what, what was that trajectory looking like? What did they have in month six of, of their journey out in, in the marketplace? Were they able to go from, you know, 1% ACV to three in year one, and they went from three to six in year two, and then they went from six to 15 in year three. And you start to get a really good feel for what some of these six brands that have kind of taken it to the next level. What, what did their path look like? And what was that measure of success? And you can start to build in some initial um, guideposts, essentially, for yourself to tell yourself, am I on track? Am I off track to what their growth looked like? Not saying you want to mirror their growth exactly, but it gives you something to measure yourself against. It gives you that benchmark to start to look at and helps you plan and forecast for what you can expect as you're entering some of these new categories. There are a few different ways that you know, I, I think one of the big ones that a lot of folks will focus on, especially a lot of, of investors, is looking at that distribution growth. A very large percentage of, of early brands' growth is coming from just getting new doors. So, you know, a lot of uh, brands are using that store count or that door count. How many doors am I getting in? And they'll set targets for themselves because they know, hey, I, I'm selling, you know, two units per store per week. I'm in 300 doors. My goal is to get to 600 next year. And I said, well, what does that mean? And as you kind of start to grow, you know, a lot of, of, of clients that we're seeing are starting in, in a, a more niche marketplace and they kind of expand from there. And perhaps that velocity can drop or it can increase or it can fall depending on what that growth trajectory looks like from in terms of a new, new distribution um, standpoint. So 
while a lot of the brands in, in the initial those initial stages are really focusing on store count, we tend to recommend that they instead start to focus a little bit more on a different way of measuring some of that distribution, at least in terms of doing your own forecasts. Same with talking to investors. You know, a lot of times they'll still revert back to that store count at the end of the day. But this percent ACV methodology, which I'll get into the definition of in a minute, tends to be a, a superior way, in, in our opinion, in terms of measuring that growth and being able to use that that baseline distribution to forecast what's what that growth means from a, a, a revenue perspective. To give you that definition, percent ACV stands for percentage of all commodity volume, which is basically, all it's basically doing is saying, what percentage of the marketplace are you in based off of weighted by revenue? In, in other words, it's giving more distribution credit to a store that does more volume than to a store that does smaller volume. So if, if you're selling, if you get your product on the shelf in a mom and pop convenience store down the road in your local town versus getting your product on the shelf in a Walmart that does exponentially more amount of volume, those are gonna be weighted differently if we use an ACV methodology. Versus a store count methodology, they both would just be one store, but they clearly will have very different expectations in terms of how fast your product would be moving in those locations. An example that's in the bottom left-hand corner here basically highlights this a little bit where it, pretend there's only three stores in the whole country. Store A, they have an all commodity volume with a total amount of volume that they're they're selling over the course of a year is $30,000. Store B, across everything they sell, they're selling $20,000 across their registers every year. And store C does $50,000 across their registers every year. If your product is in store A and store C, but not in store B, you'd have a store count or a door count of two. So your store count is, I'm in 66% of stores. My distribution level is 66%. But if you take into account how much volume those stores do, you can see that store A and store C both equate to about $80,000 a year in terms of total volume that they do. Store B being the smallest of them only does $20,000. So in reality, if we use the percent ACV methodology, it's basically showing us that, hey, we have, we're have we actually in 80, per, we're in stores that represent 80% of total volume in the marketplace. This is where, when we're starting to forecast and we're starting to communicate with investors in terms of what that opportunity looks like and what that forecast looks like as we gain more distribution, this can be a much more accurate way of starting to identify where you know, our brand is going and what type of volume we can expect from a revenue perspective. Also from a distribution perspective, um, TDP is another one that's on here that references a little bit more of that depth of distribution. It's not only taking into account what stores your products are in, but then how many SKUs are in each store. If you have, you know, if, if I'm in three stores with one SKU each versus three stores with three SKUs each, there's a difference in distribution there that's not really captured by just the person ACB methodology. Don't get too caught up on that just yet. Um, but just know that there is that difference that the TDP will take into account the number of SKUs as well as the stores you're touching or percent ACV is gonna be more focused on just what stores your product is, is located in. Both tell a compelling story and both have their use cases. To kind of give you an idea of how some of this information can be used a little bit is, is we've highlighted a, a, a little data set here that has a few brands and cookies. Obviously, this, this volume is way above what most um, brands that are, are just starting to go in for their initial rounds of funding, but it still highlights the point where with a lot of this data, we're trying to tell a story that's deeper than just what that growth rate is. So not only are we trying to tell a story, but we're also trying to forecast and create some of those benchmarks so that we know, hey, I, I have to go get X number of dollars next year in, in new growth. How do I go and get that? What? How many more stores do I need to get into? Or what, what should my retailer targets be? This will help you do that pretty effectively by using this percent ACV metric right here, which again is a percentage of all commodity volume that just takes a weighting of the stores that you're in by the side, by how much volume they do. So that it's more apples to apples comparison. And we can simply divide dollars by that distribution level to come up with what we call a sales point distribution or a velocity metric. 
but it, it also is equalizing for distribution to say for every one percentage point of distribution we have, here's how many dollars are expected to be brought in if I can maintain the same level of velocity. In other words, to make that much more simple, this brand K here, which is highlighted in green, they have 23.1% ACV, which means they're in stores that represent 23.1% of the total volume of the marketplace. They're basically in 23.1% of stores by volume. For every one percentage point or every one percentage point of ACV they have, they're bringing in $1,790,000. So that basically means, hey, if I increase my distribution by one percentage point, I bring in an additional almost $1.8 million. And that's a great thing to know because it allows you to start to forecast how many more, like what, should I be really throttling on more distribution? Should I be throttling on getting more same store sales? Should I be increasing my price to, to get to that next you know, target? This helps you set some of those benchmarks and some of those forecasts in place so that you can start to really strategize on how to go attain them. This also lets you start to identify you know, what a total share of the market might be. You know, if we're looking at a cookies as a whole up here, which does almost $4.4 million, or does more than $4.4 million, billion dollars across the year, you know, what percent share can I start to expect after year one, after year two, after year three, after year four? But for this piece, we can basically type in any number here and basically extrapolate out what we would think our distribution or what, what our uh, total dollar volume would be based on any fluctuation in percent ACV. So if I lose 1% ACV, I lose $1.8 million if my velocity stays consistent. If I gain 1% ACV, I gain $1.8 million. And if I'm brand K and I'm not in Publix yet, and I say, hey, I'm going after Publix, and I know that they make up 2% ACV of the total United States, which they do approximately, that can basically give me a good indication, a starting point to say what my size of the prize at you know, after a year or two of being in Publix might be. If I can maintain that same level of velocity that I'm getting at other retailers I'm in, I can expect about one, you know, three and a half million dollars um, more of, dis of, of revenue if I can get go national in Publix. You can start to really identify what that size of the price could be if you can keep that velocity consistent. So I see that there's a question, how do I figure out that Publix has X percent of the total ACV figure for a certain category? The ACV is actually not calculated at a category level. It's actually at the total store level. So it doesn't matter what uh, category we're looking at. That percent ACV is calculated across everything that they sell in store. In other words, Publix being 2% of of our total market means if you take all the apples, all the snacks, all the all the CPG products sold in Publix against all the CPG products sold across the country, that's where that percentage comes from. It's the total volume that flows through Publix versus the total volume of the universe that they're looking at. That does lead though to wanting to, or having the ability to be able to identify what some of that, you know, what stores move faster for certain categories than others or for certain claims and others. You know, if I make an organic gluten-free bread, you know, is that going to move as fast at Walmart as it would at Whole Foods? We have some metrics that will help you identify that pretty effectively where we can take a look at a different velocity metric called sales per million across retailers, across markets. You can't use this one across markets or, or retailers. Um, uh, when comparing directly, but we use that sales per million. You can start to identify which retailers specifically might sell cookies slower or faster than others or whatever category it might be to be able to tweak this. Again, the number that I'm giving here is just kind of a starting point. If you were to use that Publix example and say 2%, Publix makes up 2% of the total market. Let me extrapolate out with my current velocity and say, hey, this is a $3.5 million opportunity. That's a starting point, but then we can start to look at Publix and say, hey, is Publix, you know, in cookies moving faster, you know, does that category perform or move slower or faster at Publix than the rest of the market? We can identify, hey, Publix, cookies and Publix move at about, 
98% of the speed of the regular market, we then know we can adjust that down 2% or if, if, or, you know, whatever those different claims were that make your product unique, we can start to, you know, make little tweaks here and there. Again, these are kind of starting points that can give you that general idea of what that we can expect. We then can have to apply our own art to it a little bit using some of the other metrics and some other analytics that we have to really fine tune what that number would be. Obviously, there's big, big studies that you can do that can get very expensive uh, that a lot of the big brands will do to get really accurate forecasting. Um, but this is more that, you know, per being able to have a starting point that you can adjust from that starting point once we've identified what some of that, um, you know, what, what that volume could be if we can maintain that same level of, of velocity. So yeah. It, it, uh, no, I, I was just going to say, um, when I worked at Kraft Heinz, this was this slide is like the magic sauce that we kind of worked off all, off the time, all the time. We were like, oh, we are not there yet in terms of percent distribution, but another brand is. So if we want to increase our new item to, you know, the level of distribution of the similar brand or competitor brand, what's the opportunity and so this slide is you know kind of a insider cpg secret so i think that's great that we're sharing um and i know that there was a question in the chat um of the q a about you know if we don't have the sales right now like what can we use i think this is a good starting point and you know patrick what you were saying earlier of you know traction in terms of like claims and whatever those are also good um, but we can, we can, we can go back to those. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you don't have any sales whatsoever, I do think it's, it's leaning on any information that you do have. I know like uh, uh, part of this, um, investor group that, uh, helps a lot of brands like this. Like, Hey, if you have a big social media following, like highlight that you're gaining a lot of the social media stuff to show that traction too. Like there anywhere that you can start to identify that traction, but then using, some of this information to be able to identify, you know, what is the size of the prize of that or, or of organic cookies, for example. I don't currently have sales, but I want to see other organic cookie brands and how they've been able to build some of that momentum and what types of distribution, what types of share they were able to to gain over time, and start to put that up against, you know, some potential targets for yourself. That that can be very fruitful, but it obviously gets easier the more data that you are able to have solidly you know once you your data does start showing um then it becomes a lot easier because you have a lot of of prior information to go off of and, and to build on but to your point there you know in this example we, we show brand k and brand i both uh, you know the brand i is the one highlighted in blue they're at very different points from a revenue perspective. One, you know, brand I is doing almost double the volume of a brand K here, $75 million compared to only about 40. Um, but when we start to really break down based off of some of these different metrics, brand I has three times the amount of distribution. So some of these metrics can really start to tell a story. And this is a, another something that you really want to be able to highlight to your investors is look at how much better I'm doing with the space that I have than manufacturers or other companies that are much bigger than me. And what if I had that 75.2% distribution? What would my incrementality be if, if you were to say, hey, if I'm at $75.2 million, all you have to do is multiply this 1.7 times 75.2, since this is for every one percentage point of distribution that you have, the 1.8 is for every one percent of distribution that Brand K has, if I had 75.2, I can just multiply that together and show that it would be 130, I'd be doing $134 million if I could keep velocity at the same level. Um, if I had the same level of distribution that brand I did, that's an incremental $60 million a year. Um, if, if we swapped spaces, uh, it would be a, a big net gain to the category as a whole. So, there's lots of stories that you can start to unpack here, but the point that I'm really trying to drive home here is to set some of those different benchmarks for yourself that, you know, where you have, you know, if you say, I want to be a $10 million brand in five years, you know, I think an average round of funding is what, five, seven years. 
you know, how, how do we start to forecast out that next five years and put different targets against there to make sure that we're on track? Having an ACV target that I want to grow 2% ACV this year, 5% the year after, 7% the year after, once you have some figures to put up against that, it's very easy to just get those starting points that you then tweak to say, here's what I can expect for every one percentage of growth I'm getting there. Or if I know I have to be that $10 million brand, you can deconstruct it backwards and say, I'm bringing in $1 million for every one percentage point. Even if I only have 0.01% ACV, you can do the same calculation, figure out if I were at one, I'd be doing this amount of dollars and you can back into how much distribution do I need to get to if 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 I can maintain that same velocity to get to where I, to get to that ten million dollar revenue target, whatever it may be. There's lots of ways to start to deconstruct and to start to put some of these different KPIs or these different benchmarks into place. Again, referencing back to that file where you have five years of history for uh, you know a brand that you know or a couple of your competitors that you've taken a look at. What pathway did, sorry, my watch started talking on me, uh, that I can start to model myself after, and it doesn't have to match what they did exactly, but have a starting point to start to put some of those benchmarks together. The next piece speaks a, a little bit to that in terms of like that ROI piece. So one thing that we see a lot of investors do in there are a lot of, uh, our clients do in, in some of the investor decks is they ask for a bunch of money, but don't really justify it. They don't really say what they're going to do with it. There's not really an ROI pitch in there to, to the man you are to the investor themselves. So where you will spend that money and where you will, you know, how you'll start to utilize that money to impact those, those KPIs or those benchmarks can be a very powerful way to help that, investor know exactly where their investment's going and what type of growth that can help fuel. You know, if, I know if I can get this extra money and I can increase my manufacturing capabilities or I can redesign my pack to include, or I can get the funding to go actually get that organic certification, whatever it may be, I think it will add X percent more distribution. It can add, increase my velocity by X, Y, Z, because I'll be more on trend with, you know, these different trends that we've identified much earlier and start to really put together a game plan that highlights, here's why I'm asking for this much, here's the impact that I can expect it to see that we're anticipating to see based off what the data is saying, not just a shot in the dark, but based off educated and, and thorough research shows that we can expect to gain X dollars a share or percentage points a share or X percentage points of, of distribution. And then here's what my, a potential exit strategy would be and when that timing would be or what, what different KPIs we need to see when we're looking to finally start trying to sell our company. Um, if you're looking for investors, you're probably looking to sell at some point. So um, having some of that data to back up some of those different areas can be very important as well to help really communicate your story. But again, at the end of the day, these are all just little pieces of the puzzle that you use to tell your story about what's going on, to share your mission, share what you're doing out there in the marketplace and how it all kind of gets put together. You know, having that mission very clear, that that purpose very clear, having that clear target audience that you're going after, having that clear understanding of the marketplace and how you're gonna dive out and start to gain that distribution, having that strategy together, how you can identify what differentiates you and that you're on trend or that you're off trend or those different dynamics that are shifting through there. And then being able to put those forecast benchmarks together to tell that holistic story of what's going on, show that you're holding your team accountable to those different growth targets, and then ultimately being able to effectively execute on that strategy that you're putting out there and make sure that the data is guiding those decisions um, just as much as your, your experience and gut feel, but learn, being able to take and make those decisions based off solid data can be very advantageous. So that's um, wrapping up kind of the, the gist of, of what we kind of went over today. Um, are there any questions that anybody has? Um, happy to dive into any questions. Yeah, so I saw that there were some questions um, and I think that, you know, 
for the more detailed one-on-one -on -one questions, um, Alice put a link in the chat for a one-on-one -on -one consultation meeting with Nielsen IQ. As you can see, they have a lot of resources, a lot of you know knowledge on how to pitch to investors. So that could be a really good starting point if you're you know overwhelmed or not really sure where to start. Because you know I understand data can be scary, but it also can be really fun. So these people at Nielsen are really here to help out. Um, we have uh, five more minutes for questions, if anyone has any um, that are just kind of like broader to the to the group. Um, otherwise, you know, thank you so much. Yep. And yes, thanks for pointing that out. You can get three free Visor reports in the same link. So Nielsen Visor is a great resource um, for startup CPG people who are in the community. Um, and they graciously allowed us through their partnership through three free reports. So make sure to please utilize those and that's found in the link. Yeah. And one other thing to, to just point out here, I, I think one of the things that we've done that's pretty revolutionary lately is we've I, we've put together this um, market segmentation that takes a look at, I know a lot of the brands that we work with in this space are really honed in on that better for space, whether it be sustainability or it be, um, you know, better for the environment, better for society, whatever it may be, where we're able to take a look at what's going on as that, in that trend as a whole. So especially as you're diving into some of those different areas that make you unique and I really starting to put facts and figures to what that size of the prize looks like and whether it's on trend or not, we have a lot of really cool new ways to be able to dive into that really effectively that takes a look at more than just what historically has been known as a natural channel and, and kind of goes deeper and more holistically to the marketplace as a whole because shoppers' choices keep expanding um, way beyond just what the traditional natural channel is. So we have this new better for segmentation that really lets you get a really good grip on in terms of how better for products are performing, whether they're outperforming, underperforming, whatever it may be to help you guide some of those decisions, especially as it pertains to, you know, innovation or starting to identify where some of those areas of opportunities and those niches are um, that can be very important. So something to also ask your, when, if you do schedule that one-on-one -on -one with our, our folks, um, you can definitely start to ask about that a little bit and see if your brand is qualified as a better for brand. And it's all very rules-based, um, which is unique in the marketplace. It's not subjective like a lot of other competitors out there have. Something to, to keep in mind. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll give you back three minutes of your time. But Patrick, thank you so much. This has been super informative. I know, you know, everyone's trying to, you know, do the best that they can for their brand. And that means kind of pitching to investors. And that's part of part of the game. So thank you so much. I know this has been top of everyone's minds. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.